Yogendra created the class, the, the yoga classroom. This is the organizing principle of modern yoga. Uh, Middle-class Indians could go to the class, then they would go home. They weren't interested in going off to an isolated ashram and have their lives changed. They wanted to go to a class, go home, and have their lives be a, a little better. Namaste. You're listening to the Savannah Podcast. Join us on an exploration of Eastern spirituality, yoga philosophy, and conscious living for the new age. This podcast is a production of SavannahSpirit.com, where you can find a large selection of Om and yoga clothing, spiritual jewelry, and unique fair trade gifts from the Far East. Now here's your host, Ashton Subbo. Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Savannah Podcast. We've got another great show in store for today. We're going to talk all about the early pioneers of modern yoga. Now, a lot of people have heard of figures like Krishnamacharya, even more contemporary figures like Batabi Joyce and Iyengar. But today we're going to talk about someone who I feel is quite pivotal in our, our modern movement of yoga. In particular, he, he acted as a model of what we see in the West in particular of the modern yoga teacher. So I'm excited to find out more about him and, and share his story with you all. Here to talk to us about this figure, Yogendra, is Elliot Goldberg. He's one of the few scholars in the emerging field of modern yoga studies, and he has presented papers at the Modern Yoga Workshop at Cambridge University and at the American Academy of Religion. His recent book, The Path of Modern Yoga, The History of an Embodied Spiritual Practice, covers the life of 11 figures in the journey and history of modern yoga. And I'm really excited to have him on the show. Elliot, welcome. Thank you very much. So tell us a little bit about your your background. What what got you interested in in these yogic studies and, and creating your book? I had been practicing yoga in the in the 1980s. I was unhappy with my practice. Someone told me about an Iyengar class. I attended it. It was just for me. I very, very much took to the precision and elan of the Iyengar class. Soon afterward, I, I took up uh, weightlifting at a local gym. And what I saw were the uh, similarities between the yoga that I was practicing and the, the, uh, the weightlifting. So you were noticing these similarities between the Hatha yoga practice and, and weightlifting. And, and how did it progress from there? I mean, obviously, this is, this is a, a really amazing scholarly work as well with the book. How did that sort of translate into uh, diving into finding more about all these, these figures that a lot of us haven't heard of before here in the West? So at the, at the gym, I saw that the, nearly everyone around me was lift, lifting weights in a very sloppy manner. I immediately began to apply the principles that I learned in my Iyengar yoga class. So I would lift with precision, fairly slowly, with rhythmic breathing, paying attention to my entire body. And I gradually developed a, a, a way of pumping iron, you might say, <laughs> um, that was like my yoga, that it was m mindful eventually it became even meditative. In 1991, someone gave me a muscle magazine, someone at the gym, with a feature about K.V. Iyer, an Indian bodybuilder. I was very interested in Iyer. I rushed off to the New York Public Library, and there I found a pamphlet that promoted his correspondence course. And in this pamphlet, he said that his program at his gymnasium in India, in Bangalore, in, the, in his program, he taught both bodybuilding and yoga. 
I was thrilled by this. I was thrilled by this. I began to do research on AIR. It's hard to uh, imagine now in, uh, how in 1991, uh, uh, doing bodybuilding and doing yoga was something unheard of. Gradually, through my research on um, KVI year, I began to learn about other early figures in yoga. One of them was Yogendra. And, and this character as well also had a, a bit of a history with, with a very physical practice as well. He was a wrestler and, and things like that. Uh, let, let's kind of start from the beginning of again, because I mean, I really, I reading through your book, um, it, it, it brought kind of an excitement of like, wow, this guy really kind of looks at like the model of what we see as the the modern Western yoga teacher in so many different ways, both in the way that he taught and the way that he presented himself. But I kind of want to start from the beginning a bit. So Yogendra had a bit of a, a strange relationship with his guru that clearly impacted how he taught and how he presented himself in the future. Can you tell us a little bit about the relationship and how it influenced his views on, on gurus and the, the guru-disciple relationship in contrast to, let's say, the, the teacher-student relationship? As far as I know, Yogendra's account of his time uh, at, at the uh, ashram at uh, Madhava Dasaji's ashram is the only account we have of what goes on at, at an ashram, or the only the only account by an, an Indian um, uh, in the in, in the early, in the early early twentieth century. Yogendra's guru was immediately very taken with him and wanted him to be his successor. For various reasons, Yogendra rejected this offer. Yogendra created something new under the sun. He became a yoga teacher. Before this, there were no yoga teachers. I talk or I write about the reasons why Yogendra rejected this role. There are several facets of why he rejected this role. Um, one of them is that he didn't have the, the makeup to be a guru. He was not interested in living in an ashram, being responsible for, for his disciples. He wanted to live in the secular world. He, 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 he wanted to be um, not a guru, but a teacher. There's a there's a wonderful quote that that you have in your in your book from uh, from Ralph Waldo Emerson, which it it, it, it kind of also talks to something that I, I quote often on the show, something that my my jujitsu sensei said to me a lot growing up. And the quote was, uh, "It is easy in the world to live after the world's opinions. It is easy in solitude to live after our own." But the great man is he who, in the midst of the crowd, keeps with perfect sweetness the independence of solitude. And you, you, you talked about how uh, Yogendra wasn't interested in being a guru. He w he and was really the first yoga teacher because he wasn't really interested in serving the people that wanted to turn away from life just to realize the divine, which again, you talk to most modern Western yoga practitioners, the number one concern is flexibility. Then it comes like peace of mind. Like the, the, I think you know, enlightenment or touching the divine is pretty low on the list for most modern yoga practitioners now, or at least Western modern yoga practitioners. And that that's okay. What he did say, Hey, I'm, I want to, I want to bring the benefits of, of Hatha yoga to, uh, the, the middle class of Bombay, for example, which is kind of like what we see in, in the United States today, where like yoga is practiced predominantly by middle class Americans who are just looking for a, a health experience. Now in his ashram, uh, Yogendra, was using Hatha yoga prescriptively, therapeutically, uh, as you know, a means of, of, of health promotion. Was this common uh, at the time to, to treat general illnesses with, with Hatha yoga? Yogendra's uh, guru, uh, Madhava Dasaji, was a transitional figure. He had a clinic at the ashram. 
and he he treated people from the neighboring vicinities and people who came from far distances from from cities. Uh, uh, someone named Jack McKenzie is writing writing a book uh, about him. So as as far as I know, this was the first time that that Hatha Yoga um, that that the Hatha Yoga health practices uh, were taught to the outside world. Before this, they had been insular. So y- Yogendra goes and and starts up not an ashram, but a but a yoga institute. So he 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 leaves his guru's ashram and he starts up an institute, which is is quite different in that context of of how yoga was typically presented in India. Again, like coming from the guru, instead he's taking a more um, uh, scientific approach, as it were. But I, I love that so much of the, the context is is not to actually withdraw from life, but to participate in the experience of life, and that obviously comes through uh, in a lot of his a lot of his writings that you you quote in your work. And there's one as well, which which links very much to that that Emerson quote. He wrote. Experience, I found, is an exercise for the soul. It is a realization for broader circumferences. Who would be so foolish as to run away from it and let the soul shiver in timidity? And I love that because it's this, this, this invitation to, to the world. It says, like, why just sit off in a cave somewhere when, you, when you've got this amazing uh, practice called life? And that's where it really becomes the, the life is the metaphor of the practice itself, which again, is quite in contrast to the, the renunciary side of yogic thought and belief where, well, you can't really do it until you, you go away. That experience is just a distraction uh, from the rest. Yes, you, 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 Yogendra rejected the traditional means of enlightenment. He, he, he rejected uh, study. He rejected prayer. He rejected ritual and instead replace them with an experience of God or oneness or unity. Now, he, Yogendra defined yoga as a comprehensive practical system of self-culture. What, what, what did he mean by that? Yogendra uh, uh, def- defined, defined yoga as a fitness and health practice. In uh, the, the, er, the early pioneers de-spiritualized yoga. And a lot of what I write about in my book is that this was necessary in order for later generations of yogis to reinsert the spirituality in, in the yoga session itself. The, the middle-class Indians w- weren't concerned with salvation. They wanted the classes as a fitness and health exercise. And that was that big shift where it went from, or the way that Yogendra was teaching yoga went from like the spiritual quest into, in essence, creating a service for for middle class Bombay citizens. Like it was, it was a huge shift in going from well, you need to be a renunciate to be learning this practice. To hey, this practice has benefits for everybody. When I when I was reading your book, I was kind of thinking of like this is you know Bruce Lee coming out and, and teaching Gung Fu to to the foreigners um, who who might not have all the. The, the background, they might not be obviously from a particular family, but you say, hey, this has benefit for everybody. I want to share it to everybody. It's, it's very similar. Uh, some people think that uh, the commodification of yoga is something that's new. The commodification of yoga is in its, appeared in the creation of yoga. It's a part of its very essence. Yoga, yogendra, had an institute, uh, people paid for the classes, people could come and go, Un- unlike his guru who uh, uh, decided who, who was worthy of being taught. Yogendra was indiscriminate about who could take his classes. 
So the, 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 the Indian middle class could buy yoga in effect and he could sell yoga in effect. Most of us, almost all of us, would not be practicing yoga today if Yogendra had not made it into a commodity in the early 20th century. And, and that's significant, too, because and you, you touched on it, that the idea typically in the West is that America or, or the West has somehow commodified yoga and they've spoiled it. But really, I mean, we have here a character who who's Indian, who grew up in the tradition that towards the, the turn of the last century that was that was doing this and that was a pioneer of this this expression of yoga being brought over to the West, which is in contrast to, to the, the popular idea. Yoga, as most of us know it, was created in India in the early 20th century by Indians. Something that I found that was very interesting and touches on that as well is how Yogendra formed actual classes. Because when we see that, we see the parallels to the modern class where, you know, often we'll, we'll hear that, well, asana is designed for uh, allowing you for more flow of energy and to sit longer in meditation. But here we've got Yogendra who is teaching yoga sessions that last, oh, you know, about an hour or so, which that sounds pretty familiar. And then unlike often where you do some asana and then sit and meditate, he was ending those sessions in shavasana, which, I mean, is there in your in your research, was there any um, any examples of this existing before him where there was a, a class that was taught that ended in Shavasana? Because that is the, the modern yoga class for the most part. I mean, if they don't end Shavasana, it almost feels strange. As far as I know, Yogendra was the, the first person to end the class with Shavasana. Mm -hmm. the, the class began with an easy pose that that um, uh, nourished quietude. Postures themselves were done in a, in a gentle manner. And the class ended, ended with Shavasana. This had not been done before. In the, as, in the history of yoga, the, the condition, conditioning postures were done as preparation for seated meditation. Now, he also worked a lot with more dynamic postures, so not even just these, these very more grounded, still postures, but, but dynamism and transitions in between. And, and I, I've heard people make the case, and, and I don't think it, it, you need to have one or the other, that, well, there's these things that existed previously within the traditions and all that, but it, it seems very clear from your work that regardless of whether or not other things existed previously, that Yogendra himself was very much influenced by Western physical culture, the uh, gymnastics culture and things like that. Could you, could you talk a little bit about that? In particular, he was influenced by calisthenics. So modern gymnastics began in the late uh, 1700s, they were popularized in the early 1800s, and in the uh, in the also in the early 1800s, calisthenics was created. By gymnastics, I mean the um, leaping exercises with with um, say uh, a, a horse, uh, cal and calisthenics was a response to the gymnastics. Uh, the person who, who created uh, calisthenics was named Ling in Stockholm. I think it was 1850. Uh, in, the, in the early 1900s, a man named Muller created a calisthenics system that, that for home use was 15 minutes long. This was enormously popular. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Franz Kafka uh, practiced uh, Muller's uh, 15 minute calisthenics routine every day. Uh, and I'm almost certain, I'm not absolutely positive, but I'm almost certain that Yogendra picked up a lot from Muller's calisthenics system. 
We're, we don't know how yogis practiced the conditioning asanas before modern times. Did they do, say, 80 postures in, in, in one day? Did they do 20? I have a feeling that the postures were practiced the way, until recently, athletes warmed up for sports rather haphazardly. Yogendra picked up from Muller that the, that the session would be short, that it, that it would have rhythmic breathing. I don't think there was any rhythmic breathing to the conditioning asanas uh, un, un, until Yogendra applied rhythmic breathing to the asanas. Uh, and he picked up some of these calisthenic movements. There's nothing like it in, in any contemporary yoga. So his, his system involved a lot of movement, say a, a forward bend, a backward bend that was repeated 10 times or 20, or, or 20 times. This he got from Muller. So the influence of calisthenics on yoga is profound. Something that, that it, it's, it's a little bit of a sidestep from our conversation, but something in his character, that or in his story that I found to be quite interesting is that Yogendra actually caused the death of someone. Um, he, in a wrestling match, someone that had died a few days after their match. I was wondering if you could talk to that and how, given the amount of, of, of research that you've done into him, how you think that, that impacted uh, his, his life and his teaching going forward. A lot of what interested me about the, the uh, major figures who, who created yoga as we know it, a lot of what interested me was what made them tick, what their motivations were. Yogendra, as you said, was, was, was in a wrestling match and lost his, his temper and, and pressed his opponent's head to the ground. The, the opponent died Two, two days later. So I think that there were a number of consequences from this. One of them was that Yogendra very strongly emphasized that yoga should be gentle. He was opposed to any kind of vigorous exertion in any exercise, but especially yoga. So he was opposed to Surya Namaskars. He was opposed to uh, weight resistance. I don't think he, he. I don't think he was aware of how k- Killing's boy influenced him, and you know sometimes we 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 achieve our goals through very conscious effort. Sometimes we do things and we don't know why. I think Yogendra had no clue that he was emphasizing that yoga should be gentle because of the horrific act in, when he was a teenager. We don't, know, we don't always know why we do things. It, it, it's, it's interesting, as, you're, as we're sitting here talking about uh, you know, this, this incident where he, he aggressively kept smushing someone's face in the ground, they passed away, I'm hearing sirens in the background of, of, of your thing, and I'm like, ah, that's, that's, that's timing, someone else is, is, is hurting right now and the universe is, is letting us know. There's um, no, no escaping the, uh, the ambulances uh, in, in, in New York City, They're, <laughs> it's like the, um, uh, the wild animals in the nearby woods. Well, and I, and I, the few times that I've been to New York, I, I puzzled on that. I'm like, oh my gosh, don't you all hear that? And they're like, hear what? <laughs> because they're so used to it. And I was like, there's so much noise. And same thing in India. I, I know why people went off into the mountains. Because I mean, even in India, you can travel for, for an entire day on these mountain roads in the middle of nowhere. And then all of a sudden you get to a city of like 2 million people. And you're like, wait, how, what? How, how, why are, how are there so many people up here? There's noise, there's cars honking everywhere. Like it's so loud. Like, oh, people just kept going up into the mountains to, it was just to find peace and get out of all that crazy noise. And I don't think twice about it. <laughs> yeah. So Yogendra came to America, but then, then went back. Could you talk a little bit just about his, his journey over here and then and back to India and perhaps link that to, to why so many people haven't heard of Yogendra before? Uh, Yogendra came to America in, in uh, 1919. He, he thought that he should bring what he called practical yoga to America. 
Vivekananda had 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 been to America, uh, but he didn't teach yoga as a health cure. And Yogendra wanted to introduce that to America. So he was here for about two years. He was in uh, about 45 miles north of New York City on Bear Mountain uh, w- with, um, with the aid of uh, uh, socialites, rich people. He, he founded an, an institute. From his letters to friends, he was unhappy in America. And when his father uh, said that he was ill and lonely, uh, Yogendra returned to India. Uh, And you asked, there was another part to that question. Uh, just how that perhaps links to, to why we haven't heard of. I mean, we, we, we've heard of some of these other big figures, uh, Vivekananda, you mentioned, Krishnamacharya uh, is another one. Why haven't we heard of Yogendra before? Uh, Fernando uh, Pagues Ruiz wrote an article in Yoga Journal about Krishnamacharya called Krishnamacharya's Legacy in, in 2001. This was... A, a seminal article about the history of modern yoga. Uh, Ruiz presented Krishnamacharya as the father or grandfather of modern yoga. And at, at the time, it, it made sense. Unfortunately, people still believe it. There were several figures before Krishnamacharya. Uh, Yogendra is one of them. Kavala Yananda popularized yoga in in India. He was an extremely important figure. Uh, He he overcame the the repulsion that that middle-class Indians had for for yoga. He he had, uh, he not only had uh, a health resort, but he also had a laboratory in, in which uh, the conditioning postures uh, were, 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 were tested. So he, he's the one who put yoga on a scientific footing. So Yogendra and, and Kuvala Yananda were really the pioneers of yoga as, as we know it. Where, where does this fit in the timeline for people with Krishnamacharya? Krishnamacharya... Uh, taught yoga at the Mysore Palace in the early 1930s. Yogendra's yoga class was on Christmas Day, 1918, in in a suburb uh, of uh, of Bombay uh, uh, called Versova. So Yogendra was way before Krishnamacharya. And Kuvala Yananda opened his institute in 1924. So happening b- before before what we think of as this, as you mentioned, as the, the, the grandfather of, of modern yoga, we've got 10 and five years before institutions set up that not only teach yoga, but teach it in the form that is more similar to what we have in the West now versus, I mean, Krishnamacharya was teaching mostly often young school-aged boys, uh, I mean, he did open it up to women eventually and things like that, but but a, a different set, it seems like, than, than what we get with a character like Yogendra. Uh, that's right. So Ruiz m- mistakenly said, because he didn't have a lot of information in 2001, mistakenly said that Krishnamacharya revived yoga. To the contrary, in the early 1930s, there was a yoga fad, and the, the Maharaja of Mysore wanted his children to take up yoga. He didn't want to have, he didn't want to send them to the local gymnasiums where, where yoga was a fad. So he hired Krishnamacharya to teach them. And the, the cause of the fad was, I think, primarily Kavala Yananda. He had his institute, he popularized yoga through a magazine. He became part of the, um, the educational institutes. So yoga was instituted, was, was uh, inserted in, in uh, 
physical education in schools. So Yogendra and Kavali Yananda uh, were the two primary people who created yoga as we know it. There were also some other figures, Sundaram, as Sundaram is important, he wrote the first modern yoga manual. I think KV Iyer, the bodybuilder, whom I was talking about was very important because he opened his Western style gymnasium in 1922, but he taught yoga there. He promoted yoga by going on tours where, where he demonstrated bodybuilding and Sundaram uh, um, lectured and demonstrated yoga. What do you see as Yogendra's big contribution to the modern yoga practice as we know it in the West? Yogendra created the class, the, the yoga classroom. This is the organizing principle of modern yoga. Uh, Middle-class Indians could go to the class, then they would go home. They weren't interested in going off to an isolated ashram and have their lives changed. They wanted to go to a class, go home, and have their lives be a a little better. So I think this this notion of the classroom, it being limited to an hour or so, people paying for the service, people socializing afterward, having a, having a sense of camaraderie, uh, the goal of improving your health or, or protecting your health. This, this all can be summarized as the, the class, the yoga class. So for, for people that would like to, to find out more about uh, these characters, obviously I, I encourage all of our listeners to pick up your book, The, the Path of Modern Yoga. But where, where are the, the next steps? Like how, how can people start to find out more about these characters? Uh, what's a good way to connect with you in the work that you do? Uh, how can people continue on the, the exploration? I, I think as the years go on, there, there will be a lot of scholarly research this is this is just the beginning uh people can can uh write me uh i'll give you my email address it's uh first i'll say it it's uh uh, elliot goldberg yoga at gmail.com so it's e l l i o t t g o l d b e r g at, at gmail.com. I'd be happy to correspond with people. Wonderful. And we'll, we'll definitely have that email in the, in the show notes as well. Uh, but as I said, I encourage you go and get Elliot's book. It's a wonderful book. And uh, I'll say this just from a, on a personal note, a lot of scholarly work can be kind of, eh, for, for non-scholars, it can be a little dry and a little tough to get through sometimes. But one of the things that I really appreciate about uh, Elliot's writing, uh, you, you make it really accessible and kind of fun, like it's very light. The The passion that you have for these characters very much comes through in your writing, which which makes it interesting. It turns very quickly the pages instead of kind of like, oof, like it's it's some of the some of the things that I have to read or that I that I get to read and enjoy reading. But with within scholarship, it can be tough. It kind of is like grinding through the mud a little bit. And your your book has a, a very nice flow just because of the obvious uh, love and care you have for all of these figures. Thank you for saying so. The book, I think, is scholarly, but but not academic. Mm. And uh, uh, in, in contrast to most academic works, I present people in the in the round. I present not really their achievements, but their struggles. Mm. Well, I love it. Well, thank you so much for for coming on the show today and talking with us, Elliot. I really appreciate it. I hope uh, people get your book. I hope we can start to expand the conversation of of yoga, in particular modern yoga and its origins. I really appreciate the work that you're doing out there in the world. For all of our listeners out there, thank you so much for listening today. I hope you have learned something new and I hope you have a very present moment. Thanks again for listening. Namaste. 
Hey everybody, it's Ashton here with an announcement. We're starting a weekly contest giveaway over at Savannah Spirit. If you'd like to enter into the contest to win one of our weekly prizes, go to savannahspirit.com slash contest. If you enjoyed listening to the podcast today, we'd really appreciate it if you went over to iTunes, left us a review, leave us some comments, and share this podcast with anyone who you think might enjoy it. Also want to invite you to go check out Savannah East, which is the name of our blog and also the name of a Facebook group where I interact with guests and our audience. We'll post recent episodes up there as well as interesting articles relating to our guests and or the topics on the shows. And again, thank you so much for listening. Namaste. You've been listening to the Savannah Podcast. To find out more about Savannah, go to savannahspirit.com or follow Savannah on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash Savannah Spirit. For daily inspiration, check out our blog at savannaheast.com. Be sure to join us next week for a new episode. And thank you for listening to the Savannah Podcast.